Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, as always, for fitting me into your podcast listening schedule. Laszlo Montgomery here, the China History Podcast, one of the top China history-related podcasts out there, I'll tell you that. Let's finish off the other three eunuch dictators of the Ming Dynasty and see what outrageousness they did that caused them to be considered so dreadful. The first of the four, Wang Chen. We looked at him last episode. He did some damage, that's for sure. Not only led the Chinese army to its worst defeat in 5,000 years, his recklessness and failure to grasp the urgency of the situation allowed the Oirat Mongols to capture the emperor of China. I'd say that's pretty bad. And for all that, Wang Chen met a very fitting and bloody ending. And I didn't mention last episode, but even after all the damage he did, well, the Zhengtong Emperor, after he was back on the throne a second time, continued to honor his former grand eunuch posthumously. How's that for loyalty? Wang Zhi was the second of the four great eunuch dictators of the Ming. Another Wang, but not the same Wang as Wang Zhen. Wang Zhi was the first tone Wang, not exactly the same as the most popular surname in all of China, Wang, weighing in at more than 101 million people. First Tone Wang doesn't even make the top 20. Remember I said last time when Zhu Yuanzhang and his son, the Yongle Emperor, when they were putting out the last resistance to Ming domination down in the southwest of China, they castrated a lot of these people in Yunnan and Guizhou and Guangxi. And Wang Zhi, he was one of those guys coming from the Yao people of those regions. His life was inexorably tied together with one emperor, the Chenghua Emperor, a.k.a. Emperor Xianzong, not to be confused with Emperor Xianzong of Tang or any other Xianzongs out there. There were a couple others. He got to be emperor by a simple twist of fate. You remember when the Zhengtong Emperor got captured at Tumu Fort? Well, his empress, now the Dowager Empress, she agreed to put the captured emperor's brother, the Jing Tai Emperor, on the throne instead of negotiating for her husband's return, the, the Zhengtong Emperor. But in order to agree to this, her gimme at the imperial court was that her two-year-old son, Zhu Jianshan, became crown prince, and ultimately the next emperor. And that is where Wan Zhen R enters our story, Lady Wan, or Consort Wan. She was 17 years older than the two-year-old crown prince, and the dowager empress arranged for Lady Wan to serve as maid, nurse, mother, playmate, and just about everything to her son. There was a short period when the Jingtai emperor reneged on his agreement and imprisoned young Chu Jianshan, and for a while this little boy royal was sequestered away with only Lady Wan and no one else to look after him. But when the Jingtai Emperor died in 1457, as we saw last time, the Zhengtong Emperor seized back the throne, and as soon as he did that, little 10-year-old Zhu Jianshan was restored as crown prince. In age 17, he became emperor. And he wasn't bad, in the beginning at least. The official Ming history said this Chenghua Emperor was diligent in every way and brought the dynasty back from the brink due to Wang Zhen's colossally bad idea. And even though he had empresses and consorts galore, the big scandalous thing about the Chenghua Emperor was that, well, despite Lady Wan being much older than the Chenghua Emperor, 17 years, as I just mentioned, well, she became his favorite consort by a landslide. And so... Everyone deferred to her as if she was the empress and not some hired help who just got lucky. And when the Chenghua emperor was 19 and Lady Wan was 36, she gave birth to a son. And for 10 months, she was walking on air as mother to the new crown prince. But tragically, the child suddenly died and there went all her hopes and dreams. The eunuch Wang Zhi owed his rise to Lady Wan, because he worked for her. He was one of her eunuchs, and he rode up the palace pecking order on her coattails. He stuck to her like glue, and with no small amount of help on her part, he made it all the way to Grand Eunuch, and by 1476, had become a trusted confidant to the Chenghua Emperor. And the Chenghua Emperor, after a promising start, began to lose interest in the whole emperor job. 
Wang Zhi saw an opening for himself. He, he was the one who suggested to the emperor to set up what became known as the Western Depot, or Xichang. Remember last episode, there was the Eastern Depot, the Tantan Makuts of the Forbidden City? But this new office, the Western Depot, was even more powerful and had complete dictatorial powers within the bureaucracy. So now... In 1477, you had the dreaded Western Depot, and this ended up being the Chenghua Emperor's primary tool of repression, especially during the second half of his reign, and Wang Zhi was put in charge. And it was the abuse of this office that gave Wang Zhi the second spot behind Wang Jun as a bona fide eunuch dictator. And through the management of this Western Depot office, the authority Wang Zhi exercised rivaled the emperor himself. And during the mid-1480s, Wang Zhi's misapplication of the powers of the Western Depot led to many lives that were ruined or snuffed out because of his actions. Well, as much as the Chenghua emperor wanted to bring the fortunes of the Ming dynasty back from the brink, he allowed events to overtake his good intentions, and even though the dynasty still had a, a century and a half to go yet, the Chenghua Emperor, or Xianzong, if you want to go by his temple name, he ended up making a nice royal contribution to the dynasty's decline. Some of his most trusted advisors risked their necks to try and persuade the emperor to see the evil being perpetrated by his eunuchs, especially Wang Zhi, but eh, it was all for naught. Chenghua, as with many an emperor before and after him, He stood by his most trusted eunuch, and anyone who tried to have him whacked got whacked themselves. Cheng Hua and Wang Zhi, after those two had burned through what remained in the treasury, in order to raise money, well, they got some inspiration from the methods employed in Rome 14 centuries before by good old Lucius Cornelius Sulla, who carried out mass proscriptions that led to the confiscation of wealth of political rivals and enemies. Wang Zhi and the eunuchs he ran kept up another classic reign of terror inside and outside the palace. And it was this horror show of proscriptions and murder that he ran and the innocent lives ruined that earned him his place as the second eunuch dictator. The other reason, and this is why history holds Lady Wan in particularly high disesteem, was due to her conniving with Wang Zhi and other eunuchs to hold on to power within the palace. Remember, her son with the Chenghua Emperor tragically died, ten months only, and Lady Wan, she was so understandably distraught and heartbroken, and was determined not to allow anyone else to sire an heir. And Wang Zhi and all the gonggongs who worked for him, a gonggong was an archaic usage of a familial term for court eunuchs. Well, they knew everything that was going on. Wang Zhi had turned the Western Depot into an information gathering and processing center without security cameras and the benefit of software that allowed you to keep tabs on every living soul with none of that technology. They still had a lock on everything going on in the capital and beyond. And any concubine who had a roll in the hay with the emperor and became pregnant, well, guess what? The infant she gave birth to either died, especially if it was a boy, or the young woman was forced to have an abortion or given some potion to induce a miscarriage. So Lady Wan and her eunuch allies, led by Wang Zhi, they had the Chenghua Emperor scratching his head after a while, wondering what the heck was going on for so many years, a different concubine every night, and not one single son? Well... There finally was one son, and by the time he was born in 1470, the secret was out. And every concubine knew, if you wanted your child to survive, get him out of harm's way and as far away from the palace as possible. And this one prince, Zhu Youcheng, that's what they did with him. He was taken to a secure location, and he indeed got to survive infancy and childhood and became the next emperor, Hong Zhi, and his temple name, uh, Xiaozong. As for Wang Zhi, after all the lives he destroyed and all the horrors that came out of the Western Depot, 
He managed to finally run afoul of the Changhua Emperor, and his life ended in disgrace after being demoted to becoming a common eunuch. And with the demise of this second of the four eunuch dictators, that also meant a temporary end to the dreaded Western Depot. Oh, and as for Lady Wan and the Changhua Emperor, well... First, she died in 1487, followed by the forlorn and lovesick emperor who followed her three months later. And the Hongzhi emperor, after such a traumatic childhood, became emperor. And this new 17-year-old monarch, after all the damage caused by Wang Zhi, did what a few emperors did as soon as they got comfortable on the throne. He cleaned house and eradicated the worst abuses committed by eunuchs, and brought the eunuch problem down to a manageable boil. History was rather kind to the Hongzhi emperor, and his monogamy was made a big deal of. The only emperor who eschewed the need for concubines and consorts and remained true to his one true love, Empress Zhang, and history was not kind to her, and the list of her imperfections and idiosyncrasies were as long as your arm and she didn't have a happy ending in her old age. But these two, the Hongzhi Emperor and his Empress, they sired one wastrel of a son who rivaled Caligula in his outrageousness and cruelty. That's the post-October 37th CE Caligula, after his mysterious illness. This Chinese Caligula became the Zhengde Emperor, whose temple name was Wu Zong, which leads us to the third eunuch dictator, Liu Jin, and Wu Zong, he was Liu Jin's boy. Every one of these eunuch dictators had a particular emperor who they hitched their wagon to. And Liu Jin, his fate was tied to this disgrace of an emperor. I say this because the Zhengde emperor, as a young teen, raised by eunuchs, by the time he became emperor, well, he was only interested in the perks and wanted nothing of the work part. He had an intense dislike and distrust of the officials and all their Confucian demands on his life. And pretty much throughout his lifetime, brief as it was, he only wanted to have fun. He lived for entertainment and having a gay old time, carousing and partying. That's all he did. He would even dress up incognito and, and go out and mingle with the masses and more vulgar aspects of Chinese society in Beijing. And Liu Jin... He got his start in the palace as the eunuch in charge of music and entertainment. So he became very important to the Zhengde emperor early on. And with the emperor's divine sponsorship, Liu Jin rose up quickly to the head of the imperial household. And he famously had seven comrades who were part of his gang. And together, these Ocho Eunuchos were known as the Eight Tigers, the Bahu. And between 1506 and 1510, they just savaged the government, brought yet another reign of terror on the ruling class, aristocrats, military men, anyone who was unfortunate enough to get selected by them for a shakedown. And the Zhengde Emperor, he stood by them and gave them the okay to go ahead and go after anyone they wanted, he even allowed the eight tigers to strut around the palace wearing dragon robes, Gun Long Pao, reserved only for the emperor. And with Zhang De, or Wu Zong, the way he surrendered his authority to Liu Jin and his fellow tigers, they were able to commit all their foul deeds with impunity. And the palace officials, well, they didn't take this lying down, and there was plenty of pushback. In May of 1510, a Ming prince, An Hua, rose up in rebellion against the eunuchs. But in an age-old story, you're probably sick of hearing by now, Liu Jin's agents found out about what they were up to, and this rebellion was put down almost as fast as it started. And the Ming royal who led the conspiracy, Zhu Zhifan, the prince of Anhua, he got captured and led back to Beijing to face his grisly fate. And the military officer who led him back Yang Yiqing, he had been en route to the scene of the rebellion out in Shanxi and missed all the excitement. But whilst returning to Beijing, Yang Yiqing, with the Prince of Anhua in handcuffs, well, got to talking with one of the eight tigers, 
Zhang Yong, who had a few gripes with Liu Jin, and he agreed with Yang Yiching to go to the emperor together and petition for the execution of Liu Jin. Those past attempts by the scholar officials at bringing Liu Jin down ended in failure, and everyone who lined up against Liu Jin ended up poorly, either banished, all their wealth confiscated, tortured, or murdered. It seemed this capo de capo of the eight tigers was invincible. But now, with one of his own conspiring with his enemies, things were different this time. Though the Zhengde emperor wasn't sure he wanted to go against the one guy who had always been so nice and supportive of him, but in the end, after enough pressure from Liu Jin's enemies at court, finally, the Zhengde emperor, he signed off on Liu Jin's death warrant. And for his crimes, well, I hate to say it, but he suffered a pretty harsh and cruel fate. The death of a thousand cuts. Yeah, the Ling Chir penalty once again. And though it only took a few hundred or so cuts before Liu Jin breathed his last, they kept cutting away at his carcass. And someone back then must have been counting, because... Supposedly, they sliced off 3,357 bits of his flesh. The Asian Wall Street Journal reported in 2001 that by the time they cleaned out the last kilo of gold and silver from his residence, it added up to about 450,000 kilos of gold and 9,700,000 kilos of silver, which at today's spot price is added up to about $33 $33 billion, which made him about as rich as Lei Ka-sheng. Not bad. And Liu Jin didn't even have a real estate empire. After Liu Jin met his well-deserved end, the other seven tigers eh, kept on keeping on. They still engaged in mischief until the Zhengde Emperor finally met his well-deserved early exit in 1521. Didn't even make it to 30. But wait, it gets worse. Next up was the most villainous and malevolent eunuch of them all, or so it's been said. In fact, most sources I read, they call Wei Zhongxian the most atrocious eunuch in all of Chinese history, which by this time in the series really says something. Going back to Zhao Gao in the 3rd century BCE, there have been some pretty dreadful ones. So what was so bad about Wei Zhongxian? Let's see if we can get through his demolition of the Ming dynasty before the end of stoppage time, Wei Zhongxian lived from 1568 to 1627. He was born just after the Ming dynasty was rising up from the rubble left behind by the Zhengde emperor's abysmal outing as ruler of China. Next up after him was the Jia Qing emperor, another one who wasn't into the job and refused to deal with his ministers and officials, opting instead to let his eunuchs do his talking. No tigers, attendants, or eunuch dictators to speak of during the reign of Jia Qing and his successors, Long Qing and Wan Li. But nonetheless, eunuchs were still plentiful and often up to no good. And these three emperors, though not as bad as what transpired during the Zhengde era as far as their Inattention to the job and dependence on eunuchs went. Nonetheless, didn't do anything to halt the rapid decline in the fortunes of the House of Zhu and their Ming dynasty. Nah, if the founding Hongwu emperor could have only seen the sad shape his dynasty was in a century and a half after his passing, and his iron plaque that he left in a conspicuous location of the palace, warning against empowering eunuchs, that had already been made a mockery of by his son, the Yongle emperor... He wouldn't have been happy. So, Wei Zhongxian, like all the greatest heroes and worst scoundrels in Chinese history, his life is all wrapped up in legends, rumors, and unsubstantiated stories, like this one. It's said in his youth, he loved to have a good time. Drinking, gambling, carousing, and partying. And in his early 20s, he had accumulated enough gambling debts whereby his only way out was to either kill himself or do something drastic to avoid the debt collectors. So he had himself castrated and was able to work his way into the royal palace. Now, a quick word here about the whole matter of castration. Way back in the day, going back to the Han Emperor Wu, when captured soldiers and enemies were turned into eunuchs, Well, if the emasculation procedure didn't turn out so well and the guy died, not the end of the world. 
But now, all these centuries later in the Ming Dynasty, the eunuch profession was already quite developed and the demand was such that more attention was paid to the surgical procedure and ensuring the survival rate was as close to 100% as possible. And these surgeons, if you will, they had to have a license and had better be good at their job. And like it is with anything with science and the medical profession... After so many centuries of trial and error, by the time of the Ming, they pretty much got that survival rate up to near perfect, which didn't guarantee one a cushy job in the palace, but gave the prospective eunuch a shot nonetheless. And we'll discuss these skilled tradesmen who did the deed in the next episode. They were called Daozi Jiangs. So Wei Zhongxian, no easy path to riches and power for him. He had to work his way up the ladder. And in 1605, after more than two decades punching at a clock and serving as a run-of-the-mill eunuch, performing rather menial duties, he got his big shot. In that fateful year, he was called on to serve the grandson of the Wanli Emperor as his chef. And this grandson, known by his era name of Tianqi and the temple name of Shizong, Well, he was to Wei Zhongxian what all these other eunuchs we've looked at were to previous emperors. Zhao Gao and Qin Er Shi, Gao Li Shi and Li Fu Guo with Tang emperors Xuanzong and Su Zong, and Tong Guan and Hui Zong, Wang Zhen and Wang Zhi and the Ming, Xuan De and Zheng Tong emperors. Always in pairs, a pliable emperor and a scheming, power-hungry eunuch. Like ice cream and pound cake. A match made in heaven, or hell. And in the case of the late Ming Dynasty eunuch Wei Zhongxian, it was this young Tianxi emperor. Their relationship started when this future emperor was only the crown prince, Zhu Youqiao, a young lad. And this young'un, born in 1605, well, his mother died in 1619, and with her gone, his wet nurse, known as Madame Ke, who had raised him since infancy, like wet nurses are wont to do, she became his substitute mother figure. And these two were incredibly close. And being the wet nurse to someone as high up as the next in line to the throne came with no small amount of fringe benefits. And with his job serving as the crown prince's master chef, Wei Zhongxian got to know Madame Ke quite well, and the two became very close indeed. In Chinese, there's a term, duishu. It referred to either two palace women who lived together in a kind of relationship, eh, maybe or maybe not sexual, or in this case, with Madame Ke and Wei Zhongxian. It referred to a palace woman and a eunuch who lived together as husband and wife. These two were a pair, and together they held the future Tianqi emperor in the palms of their hands. And aside from being young and easily manipulated, the crown prince, Yang Zhu Yo Jiao, well, it was written into the histories that he was as ignorant and uneducated as one could be in his privileged position, and perhaps he may have even had mental disabilities. 400 years ago, eh, who's to know for sure? But over the course of his childhood, Madame Ke, Ke Shi, and Wei Zhongxian, well, they manipulated him to the extent that when he became the emperor in 1621, following the death of his father after less than a month on the throne, (laughs) gee, wonder what happened, he did what many a previous emperor did and left anything of importance to those he was closest with, in this case, his wet nurse and his eunuch cook. How could anything go wrong? And Wei Zhongxian, having once been a bit of a party animal and seeker of fun times in his pre-castration days, well, he was like a kindred spirit to this young emperor who had no interest in anything except carpentry, loafing, and seeking pleasures in all forms. And Wei Zhongxian took care of him in all these respects. Madame Ke had helped in greasing the wheels for Wei Zhongxian's rise to the top. First, she cleared the path for his ascension to the Sili Jian, the Directorate of Ceremonial. If you recall from last episode, this office handled palace security, the eunuch school, the imperial libraries and works of art, the imperial tombs, and communication with the emperor and punishing those who either broke the laws or were in the crosshairs of eunuchal retribution. And Wei Zhongxian got even with everyone. 
He cobbled together a network of eunuchs throughout the palace who were loyal only to him. And by now the supply of eunuchs far exceeded the demand. Even with the greatest eunuch population in Chinese history, some people were so desperate for a chance, they were slicing off their private parts to get a shot at life in the Forbidden City. It's said the eunuch population around this time, deep in the fourth quarter of the Ming Dynasty, numbered around 100,000. Once he had full control of the Directorate of Ceremonial, Wei Zhongxian had himself appointed head of the dreaded Eastern Depot, and it didn't take long before he controlled the big three offices that struck fear in everyone's hearts. The Directorate of Ceremonial, Eastern Depot, and the Embroidered Uniform Guard. He truly was invincible. Madame Ke, she too had her rivals, and the one person who she had a serious hatred of, who outtrumped her in the palace, was the Tianqi Emperor's wife, Empress Zhang. And this woman didn't take any you-know-what from Madame Ke, like Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote in the old Looney Tunes cartoon. Madame Ke kept trying to bring this empress down, but she failed time and again. Wei Zhongxian had his detractors, of course, and they all got murdered, or worse. His most formidable foes were a group of conservative Confucian scholar officials who comprised the so-called Donglin faction, the Donglin Dang. They had organized themselves during the reign of the Emperor Wan Li. They saw what was happening to the dynasty and tried to implement reforms that would, I don't know, I guess you could say make China great again. They tried a couple times, in 1622, and again in 1624. The first time, Wei Zhongxian fought back, had the Donglin Academy shuttered, and wiped out a number of the more high-profile Donglin members. Then two years later, having not learned their lesson, several Donglin faction leaders sent a memorial to the emperor, enumerating 24 crimes that Wei Zhongxian had committed. You'd think they should have known that this thick-witted emperor wasn't going to side with them, but they went after Wei Zhongxian anyway, and what followed was a two-year purge that saw all the leading members of this faction incarcerated, tortured, and executed in what was surely a painful ending for all who were on the receiving end of Wei Zhongxian's wrath. It took until the next emperor's reign before they could make a comeback. These years, from 1625 to 1627, are said to have been, at the palace level that is, the most bloody and gruesome years in Chinese history. And that, my good-looking listeners, says a lot. So with this last serious challenge to his authority done away with, you'd think Wei Zhongxian could kick back and relax. It wasn't meant to be, though. 1627, the year of the fire rabbit was fated to be a rough one for Wei Zhongxian. When his meal ticket, the Tianqi Emperor, a.k.a. Xi Zong, when he was ill and not looking like he was going to make it to his 22nd birthday, Wei Zhongxian and Madame Ke came up with a strategy to get one of Wei Zhongxian's kin, his nephew, made the crown prince. All they needed was Empress Zhang's okay, and they could take care of the rest. But she had always been wary of these two and had even tried to convince her not-too-terribly bright husband that this eunuch who he put so much trust and faith in was nothing but a Ming Dynasty Zhao Gao. You see, Wei Zhongxian knew one thing was for certain. If this emperor died, he was essentially screwed. So in trying to attempt this usurpation of the throne... Wei Zhongxian was trying to avoid having a run for cover if his young, foolhardy patron died suddenly. But that's what ended up happening. You know, it said Wei Zhongxian and Madame Ke were doing the same thing Lady Wan had attempted, killing and incapacitating any potential heirs to the throne. But as soon as Xi Zong, this hapless Tianqi emperor, breathed his last, the jig was up for these two, perhaps lovebirds and partners in crime. As soon as the new emperor, Chongzhen, was comfortable on his throne, he ordered the arrest of these two. Their residence was raided and all assets confiscated. Madame Ke, she got beaten to death in prison. And Wei Zhongxian, well, he didn't get off so easy. Without his boy, the Tianqi emperor, to cover for him, and after all that he had done to so many innocents, 
he knew his end wasn't going to be by lethal injection. So he went and hung himself before he could meet the grisly end he knew was coming. And after his burial, the Chongzhen Emperor gave the nod to dig up his corpse and have it publicly dismembered. This last and final Ming Emperor, I'll give him an A for effort. He tried, but too much damage had already been done. And he too ended up hanging himself when the Manchus from the north were invading his capital and all was lost. The Ming Dynasty didn't fall solely because of Wei Zhongxian, but at a moment in history when a comeback could have saved the day and prevented the subjugation of China by the Manchus, Wei Zhongxian was too busy taking care of himself and having so many capable leaders and administrators bumped off. And as soon as the 20th century arrived on the scene and movies and television became popular, you can bet Wei Zhongxian has been a regular staple in many of these Ming Dynasty era miniseries and dramas. And one racy novel after another followed in the wake of his death, lifting him up as a kind of legend, exaggerating his alleged sexual prowess despite his shortcomings. In fact, this is a whole other subtopic to this general overview I've been presenting these past four episodes. The whole subculture of these pseudo-marriages between these emasculated eunuchs and the palace women of all sorts. There was a whole world going on that I'm not mentioning that we'll have to wait till some other time. For now, this is Laszlo Montgomery of the China History Podcast, signing off from Los Angeles, California. Springtime is coming. Already moved the clocks forward last Sunday. My favorite day of the year. Qing Dynasty next time. I wouldn't miss that one for the world. And one last desperate plea to everyone out there. You can support me at patreon.com slash China History Podcast or show your love and appreciation at paypal.me slash China History Podcast. Details at the website at teacup.media. Take care, everyone.